So would you like to start by introducing yourself? Yeah, my name is Jim Jasper. I uh, was in the 1st Battalion Royal Fusiliers between 1952 and 54, served in Korea and Egypt. And uh, then I was in the TA for three years when I come back. And said, well, I left the army then because I, I was having national service. And uh, since then, I've been working in the building trade all my life till I retired. Yeah. Where and when were you born? I was born in uh, East London, uh, Stepney, uh, in uh, 1931. And were your parents, were your, was your father in the army? He was in the First World War. It's strange, really, because he joined when he joined. Uh, he joined at the Tower as well, the same as I did. But he was uh, he, he was too young to go to France. But he would have gone to France in in 1918. But the war finished then, so. But he was in the Hollowbar Artillery Company. And did he influence influence you to join? Was no, not really. Reason? No. Okay. I had to join because uh, it was a national service. Everybody had to do it if that was fit. And how did you feel to be told that you had to do national service? Well, in some ways I, I, I thought I was going to quite enjoy it because it was a chance to travel. You know, I, I wouldn't have liked to have been like, in the army and just stayed in England all the time. So at least I had a chance to travel. And how did you enlist for national service? What was the procedure? Uh, well, that? when you was 18, you you got papers to have a medical, and uh, if you was fit, you, then about what three months later you got a letter to report to a unit to start training. Well, I had to report to the Tower of London for the Royal Fusiliers, so I done eight weeks training at the Tower. Then we do six weeks at Canterbury, then went on embarkation leave, and went abroad. And what was your training like at the tower? Very tough. It was very nice, to be honest. <laughs> some of the things, I, I enjoyed some of the things, like the drill and firing guns and things like that, but I didn't like the spit and polish, what you had to do in these days, which I don't think you have to do so much now. And what kind of drills did you have to do? Well, it was, uh, yeah, marching, present arms, slope arms, and things like that. And like what parts of the tower site did you use for the well, training? Well the, uh, we used the, the, the program at just outside here. That was the that was the program. And where over the, what it's called uh, no, Wellington Barracks on the right, that's where we that's where we lived in there. Because in those days the ta uh, jewels was in uh, the, the White Tower I think it was, yeah. And what were the living conditions like in the Wellington barracks? A bit rough. <laughs> it was clean, but there wasn't a lot of, uh, I mean, there wasn't no hot water or anything like that. Just cold water in the, uh, in the, uh, in the toilets and things like that, you know. So it was, uh, wasn't too good. Were the first few days a bit of a shock then? Well, I was, yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Can you remember what it was like on your first few days? Well, yeah, I mean, I came... I came to the tower to write a report and you had to wait out at the gate, main gate and there was a yellow water there. So if I was you, he said, I'll run, I wouldn't bother to come in. <laughs> so that, that, that for a while there. They, the, then we had a, the, the sergeant come along and he, he like took us into the uh, main barracks. Yeah, and then uh, you get an uh, issue with your kit and that sort of stuff first. Did you find it easy to get on with the others? Because a lot of accounts of training say that it was very difficult to find similarities with some of the other people. Well, no, it was uh, mostly it was all East London lads, so you know it was uh, well, it wasn't bad really. And what were the instructors like who were leading your training? Uh, strict, very strict, but I suppose you could say it was fair. Everything was done, you know, there was a little bit of humour there as well sometimes, so, you know, it wasn't too bad. You know, you're standing on, on my stand on your hair and, you know, get your hair cut and that sort of stuff. I mean, you see that all films, but that's what happened. <laughs> Can you remember any of your um, instructors? Was there any that particularly stood out for you? Uh, I think uh, there, was, there was a Corporal Rangbury here. He was a... Uh, 
he was in charge, of, like directly in charge of us, and he was the one that really we, we had the most dealings with. I mean, a sergeant was like God. You only saw him occasionally. <laughs> And was the discipline really hard? Oh yes, yeah. oh, it was, yeah. And what kind of discipline was like handed out when you're in training? Uh, well, you, if you was, uh, it was, had a like me, I, I was got, I, I forgot to uh, clean my bayonet one day, and I got three days to find the barracks. So what you have to do, you have to report about half past six every morning to the uh, regimental police, and you uh, you spent the day like cleaning toilets out and things like that, and peeling potatoes and that sort of stuff. Yeah. What did you do in your spare time when you weren't training? We didn't have a lot of spare time really. Uh, I suppose there was a canteen here, we used to go in there every evening. Uh, but during the day, I mean, you, you didn't get a minute to yourself really. And then you, was, you didn't, I mean you wasn't allowed out for the first couple of weeks. But then once I, you could go on sort of weekends then for uh, sort of uh, what your 24 hour you know passes and things like that while you're in, <coughs> in England. Was there any sport that you could do in your spare time when you were at the tower? No, plenty of physical training, but no actual sport. Could you describe an average day of your training at the tower? Uh, well, your first thing you, you had to, you know, your rally was at six o'clock, I think it was, if I remember rightly. You had to go down, wash, shave, because I was pretty hot in shaving. Uh, you had to come back, clean up, you had to, you had to get, put your blankets all neat in a special way on the, on the uh, bed. Uh, they used to, they used to go out perhaps for a PT come back, have your breakfast, then you might have sort of a couple of hours on a square drilling, uh, and then you'd get a regimental history where I've told you the, you know, the, all about the regiment and things like that, and uh, then you spend a lot of time cleaning your kit, that was the main things. Then you had a rifle drill on the square, and then uh, while you was here, for, for about three days you went to Perfleet on the rifle ranges but first I mean they, got, they used to have a small rifle range here in the back where it's used to shoot the spies <laughs> but uh, we used to do like that was where you first fired a rifle in there but then you went to pitch it at uh, Perfleet and places like that you know to actual do the and what was the food like whilst you were at the tower? <clears throat> It was plain. I suppose you could say it was, you know, I could eat it, but it was plain. It was nothing fancy. Yeah. And under what circumstances do you, did you eventually leave at Canterbury? What, that, what? Did you go to Canterbury? Yes, that Ireland? was a, pre, yeah. other tra that was uh, to continue with your training because you more advanced training there, you know, field training sort of thing. Uh, then you went, <coughs> you went on a 25 mile route march to Canterbury. Yeah dug in, they might repel or an attack and things like that. And what was an average day like at Canterbury compared to being at the Tower of London? It was, uh, I should say it's a little bit easier because once you sort of got your basics you get used to it I suppose. Yeah. And how did you keep in contact with your family? Uh, well only by your... letter, letters that's all. And what was their, were they pleased that you were in the army? Not really, my mother was worried, especially when I went to Korea. <laughs> And then what did you do after you left Canterbury? After we left Canterbury? Yeah. Well, we went on a, a two weeks embarkation leave, which we was called back early because the boat was going early, so only got about 10 days. <coughs> we got, went to, uh, by train to Liverpool, got a troop ship, Empire Pride, where we slept in hammocks. Then we, we went to Hong Kong, that took about five, six weeks. Then we stayed in Hong Kong for a few weeks training and then went on to uh, Japan, battle school, before we went to Korea. So you got about a bit, you know, you wanted one place to go. And what was battle school like? Well that, they say it was more dangerous than in Korea actually, <laughs> because uh, you usually do a lot of fire, live firing exercises there, 
where you use your real ammunition, you know. And, uh, you used to have to sort of advance on your hands and knees and those throw a machine gun over your head. But uh, they, it was supposed to be, they say, it was four foot above your head. But it was, it was more like six, seven foot, just to make you keep your heads down. But that was giving you like experience of being fired at, sort of thing. Mm. And then so after back school you went to Korea? Went to Korea, And yeah. um, what happened then when you landed? Where did you land? We landed at Pusan. Then we uh, got a train up to, to join the 1st Battalion, because I was in reserve at the time. Uh, and then when, when we got there, we was, you know, deciding what company was going with it and that, so, and that was it, no, it was there. So which company were you? Oh, was it, I was a C, I was attached to C Company. Mm -hmm. And so what did C Company do then, were you billeted anywhere, or? Well, no, we, we, we lived in uh, tents when he was in reserve, but when he was in the front line, he lived in holes in the ground, with a roof on. <laughs> Bunkers, as they call them. So, what did you do during the day? Were there many actions that you saw, or? Well, it's a lot. Mostly, it was uh, shelling and uh, uh, patrol actions. Uh, I was a signaller, so I used to have to go around and repair the lines and uh, take uh, light, telephone lights out to standing patrols and things like that. Mm -hmm. But it was quite a bit of. We had a few. We had about thirty-two killed, I think, in total in Korea. What was the shelling like to experience? Oh, it, no, it's bad. You know, you, you had to keep it keep under cover. But uh, <coughs> I suppose once you get into it, I suppose you get used to it, really. But when you first go up there, you think you know, you don't know what's going to happen. It does, it's all uh, strange, like you know. But after a, sort of two or three weeks, you sort of I suppose you get a bit used to it. But most most people, they won't worry about getting killed so much. It was to get like getting like. Injured, badly injured, or like blinded, or something like that. That was the main thing. Uh, um, did C Company experience any action at any point during career? Well, yeah, they, they had. Uh, we had a we had a few killed uh, uh, with uh, patrols and uh, shelling. Yeah, I mean it was quite a bit. What were patrols like? Where did you go? Well, you were in no man's land. And you saw uh, you had you. you you was just in front of the, mostly just in front of your positions to case anybody, so if anybody's going to attack you, you know, you, like you knew beforehand. You said you were a signaller, did you take another training course for that? Yeah, well I did that, like, while I was out there in Korea, yeah. Yeah. Um, um, when, when you were told to go to Korea, what were your reactions like when you needed to go? Well, I was told the first day we joined the army was going to Korea, so we knew all along. But uh, yeah, so we was so I suppose being young, we'd been in the war, or just the war had finished. But, you know, everybody knew somebody that was in the army, so I don't suppose it would uh, it really uh, hit home like it would now. I mean, people now, I mean, not used to it. So, you know. so were you afraid when you when you knew you need, you had to go out and fight? Yeah. Not, af not afraid, really. I suppose. I suppose a bit nervous. Yeah, yeah. It's a uh, funny, funny feeling, really. You don't, don't know what to expect. That's what it is. So, um, when you say not to expect, how do you feel with the difficult weather conditions and/or terrain? Well, it's very cold in the winter. Yeah, you know, I mean, you could uh, you could dig down about three foot, and it was still frozen. The earth. It was. Uh, yeah, it was pretty. It was pretty. It, it, about in the summer, it was hot. How did you cope with the extreme weather in Korea? Was there any way you could cope? Well, you had to really. I mean, actually, I would say, will say that our cold weather equipment, like the coats and that, was pretty good. You know, and the boots was good. You know, so I mean, we was better when the first Korean War first died and the battalions went out there. They didn't have all that. They sort of went out there with uh, just, you know, thin, thin uniforms and that. But once we was there, we, we had we had like a parka, which is a big big coat and uh, combat jackets and boots and thick socks, string vests and everything. So that wasn't too bad. Yeah. Did you feel that the weather impeded sort of patrols or anything? Uh, no, not really. No, no, no. 
We had, we had quite a bit of a heavy snow there, yeah, but uh, we had the worst snow actually. We was in the battle school, in, in, I was in the mountains in, in, a, in a Japan. Yeah, it was near Hiroshima actually. Yeah, and uh, it was about two foot thick there where we was out in the hills, and we had to, st we had to st stay there. We couldn't move for about tw 36 hours. Yeah. So, um, when you went on the front line, how did the soldiers occupy their time? Well, you went in reserve, and you carried on training. Yeah, you had a, we had a, everybody had a five days in Tokyo leave. And then they had a, another camp at Incheon leave camp, so you had a few days there. But otherwise, you were just trading. So, a reserve ready to go back if the Chinese attacks again. <laughs> what did you do when you were in Tokyo? Oh, I just, uh, well, just, it's only five days. Uh, it's a bit sightseeing, really. Yeah, went to a few uh, sort of nightclubs and things like that, had a few drinks, and that was about it. <laughs> how aware were you of the political situation? Pardon? How aware? How aware were you of the of the um, political situation in Korea? Oh, yeah, I was. We was pretty well. You know, we had sort of lessons. Well, you know, talks on it about. It, so you know, really, what was happening. Like I say, today they put the wrong flag up, didn't they? <laughs> I bet that pleased them. <laughs> um, do you think that Stalin's death and Eisenhower's election had an impact upon the conflict? Oh yes, definitely. I think so. Yeah, I think Stalin was the main man, wasn't he? But I, I think uh, he was. He died in 1953, didn't he? Yeah. Yeah, probably did. I should think so. Yeah. Um, 